when I think about Chinatown, I, I think the thing that resonates most powerfully for me is the idea of, of Giddy's and the fact that he's kind of impotent against the tremendous depravity that he's witnessed. Uh, was, was that a major theme for you? Well, yeah, yes, uh, bearing in mind that um, he didn't think he was. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, he, he, he thought he, uh, he could be ahead of the game and never fully realized the extent to which he was behind the game. Mm. You know, he, he thought he could control more than he could. Uh, and and do more about it. Um, I think it was a time when the, this was took place before World War uh, Two, and and I think the extent uh, of of uh, the, the basically the evil of, of, of which Noah Cross was capable. Uh, wouldn't occur to a guy who um, really spent most of his time doing divorce work and things like that, and so uh, the, the corruption seemed on a kind of petty level to him. Mm-hmm. And he, he felt he'd seen it all and known it all, but he just wasn't prepared for uh, the crime against uh, the, the city in the future. And and by extension, his own child. Yeah. Well, what strikes me about films from that period, uh, the 70s, uh, is the idea that they, whether it, whether it was um, explicit or subversive, they always kind of reflected the, the, the chaos of the time or the p- particular political landscape of the time. And even though Chinatown takes place in L.A. in the 30s, what about that particular time in the seventies? Do you feel was was mined from that film? Well, uh, it was it was certainly resonated uh, backward. I mean, we had giant conspiracies that we didn't think that. Um, I, I think the general feeling was that it was a shock. That uh, the government was capable, of, that the president was capable of doing what he uh, uh, had done, and, and, and capable of covering it up any and every which way he could, and uh, that was true of Vietnam. That was true of uh, of um, Watergate. I mean, that the government was quite capable of lying to us. Mm-hmm. I don't think you know that that was kind sort of a radical notion at that time. And it was reflected in, uh, in a lot of films that dealt with conspiracies of one kind or another, or certainly not critical ones. I mean, there was All the President's Men, uh, The Parallax View. There, there were many films who uh, reflected the fact that, uh, uh, that the government was quite capable of, uh, of corruption and, and, and lying. And that was something that was kind of new. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a lot of irate citizens when they find out that they're paying for water that they're not going to get. Oh, that's all taken care of. See, Mr. Gibbs, either you bring the water to L.A. or you bring L.A. to the water. How are you going to do that? By incorporating the valley into the city. Simple as that. How much are you worth? I have no idea. How much do you want? No, I just want to know what you're worth. Over ten million? Oh, my, yes. Why are you doing it? How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can't already afford? The future, Mr. Gibbs. The future. In terms of your script, it's... I mean, it's renowned for its its beautiful structure. And I understand that that was an arduous process to kind of achieve the the balance of all these these elements, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, I I mean, initially... Um, you know, one of the, uh, uh, I mean, starting with the notion of a guy who is basically rapes the land and his own daughter. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think one of the initial structural things is which uh, crime do you want to reveal first? And actually, I had to think about that for a while. And it became.
became obvious that the the more public crime was the one that had to go with first, and then work your way into uh, the, the personal one. What were there subplots and kind of backstories along the way that that got uh, that got thrown out? Uh, well, in a way, yeah, uh, there was a subplot that dealt with Escobar, the 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 uh, cop who had worked with Guinness in Chinatown, and uh, in one permutation of it, there was a, a, a plot that actually had him um, knowing from childhood uh, Evelyn Mulray. Um, but there just, in, in, in the end, that was sort of dropped because it was impossible to, I mean, it was quite complicated enough as it was. Yeah. Tell, I know that you worked very closely on a few, uh, with uh, your collaborators on, on quite a few of your projects, particularly in this period. Uh, tell me about uh, Mr. Polanski, who I'm obsessed with his work as well. W- what kind of special flavor he brought out in your script that was unique to him, in your view? Well, certainly one of the things that, that Roman was... Um, Roman was wonderful at, at, at um, being willing to take the time uh, uh, with a story that that was, um, you know, that complicated and, and or complex or however you want to put it. Roman, you know, you know the term shoe leather in terms of movies, mm-hmm. um, where you know all of the the, the things that uh, movies traditionally had found, uh, the, 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 you know, the, it's cut to the chase and 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 um, get rid of all the little things that um, don't really immediately uh, um, lead to action. And that Roman understood that in order to make it realistic, um, that the shoe leather aspect of it was uh, uh, was important mm-hmm. and I mean uh, scenes for example like uh, going to the Hall of Records and taking the time to go through uh, all of those details that actually gave it a level of reality that, that uh, otherwise it never would have had to be willing to take the time to do that and it, and it kind of adds to the immersive quality of, of the film, too, those those details. And his willingness to uh, to make it totally about the, uh, from the point of view of, of the detective, mm-hmm. uh, I think was critical. I mean, to this day, I think it's the only film I can think of in, in which the point of view is never broken. Right, right. You were with him, and and you were always. It's not just a pure point of view; it's an over-the-shoulder shot, which is so right for a detective. Mm-hmm. Where you're, you're um, you, you, which is like a dream, and all all detective stories are, are a bit like that. Yeah, you're you are behind him. Uh, and at the same time, you, you are watching him. So you discover it, what he discovers when he discovers it. And, right. and the discipline of doing that, I think, was uh, extraordinary. The appreciation of, of Jack's profile, the hat, and everything. Um, that discipline, uh, I think, was vital to uh, making that movie work the way it did. Another director you've collaborated with, uh, who I'm also crazy about, and that that was Hal Ashby. Hal was, um, uh, I hope you, uh, I mean this really in the best possible way, Hal was Chauncey Gardner. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the the character of being there, Mm -hmm. the guy who says, I like to watch. Uh, Hal, Hal was, his primary gift is a, um, and everybody who directs has one primary gift. Um, if, the, if they've 
you know, I mean, with Hal it was editing, uh, with Bobby Fosse it was dance and choreography. I mean, you can go through uh, all everybody and, and think it almost like the military. They have a primary MOS, military occupational specialty, mm-hmm. and Hal was 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 watching. I mean, he was brilliant at choosing what he uh, what he shot. And editing, and, and um, editing it for reality, and he he wasn't a provocateur on a set, but he was quite willing to uh, let the action go wherever it went, and 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 had an uncanny ability to pick out what was.